Um, I'm Nancy Patch. Uh, I'm actually the one of the co-founders of Cold Hollow to Canada. Uh, Cold Hollow to Canada is a small regional conservation partnership located in seven towns at the northern border of Vermont. Uh, we uh, we abut Canada along our, our northern border, and we are in the Northern Green Mountain linkage, which is one of the important um, linkages in the northern forest. The northern forest is um, a bioregion that uh, goes from uh, west of the Adirondacks in the Tug Hill Plateau all the way up to uh, the tip of Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. We um, cover three provinces and four states. Uh, and it is the most intact broadleaf temperate forest in the world. Um, so it is a globally significant forest and that uh, makes our work uh, feel all the more important. And uh, it, is a, it is something that we relay to, our, to the folks that we work with, um, thinking about a globally significant forest and what you can do in your own backyard Cold Hollow to Canada started a, a number of years ago, around 2009 is when we, we uh, started working on these goals. And, and we have three um, major goals within our organization, um, uh, sustainable stewardship of forest land conservation and community empowerment. Uh, so we're a grassroots organization. So what we do is we, we're, we're on the ground working with people uh, in their forest. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about communicating with, with, the, with the folks on the ground. And in particular, we want to uh, highlight uh, one of our programs uh, called the, the Cold Hollow to Canada Woodlots Program. And we had been asked, uh, this has been, it's been our signature program, actually. We, we're really known region-wide for the work that we do in this peer-to-peer -peer stewardship program. And people would always ask us, uh, okay, how do you how do you go about doing this? Um, and so when we uh, the, in, at the New England Regional Conservation Partnership meeting um, that we have annually, uh, that was a question that would be asked, and people were asking, why don't you put something together that could help other people uh, move forward with a program like this? So we actually got some funding to do just that very thing, and uh, we have put together uh, what we call the toolkit which is located on our website and is open source. It is something that anybody can use. And, and one of the things that I, I want to, like Monica is going to be walking through this toolkit with us, Monica Ag, Monica Prishbahar actually put this toolkit together and did, it, did a really amazing job doing it. And uh, we are going to be walking through that and sharing that with you. And just as a uh, one note, um, I was talking recently with uh, Sam Perrin at the Northwood Stewardship Center, also in Vermont, and uh, Sam has taken this, our Woodlots Program Toolkit, used it, and adapted it to his own situation. So that's what we really want to talk about today, is we've got a process that we used, and you can have, use any of the materials that we put together, but really... I want to talk about, and hopefully the questions coming forward uh, throughout the evening will really be focused on, okay, how do, how do we do this and how do we tailor it to our own world? Uh, so we were, were really pleased that we were able to put this toolkit together because we were asked so many times. And people often work um, struggle with how to do this peer-to-peer -peer landscape stewardship um, programming. So um, I think and hope that this is going to be able to give some give some uh, help to folks trying to come you know to build their own thing in, in the, uh, along these lines. So I'm I'm just going to now I just hand it over to Monica. I'm going to be here, of course, um, answering questions that can any questions that may come up, uh, and also be available at the end to to have a more uh, another some more discussion around the programming. So. Here you go, Monica. You can introduce yourself and, and take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Nancy. So I'm Monica Prisper Hart. Um, I've been working with Cold Hollow to Canada for a few years now um, <clears throat> in various positions, but including the program director position um, where I was administering this program that we're about to introduce to you. Um, and, um, and I'm going to share some, some slides here. Um, oh, actually, Colleen, if you could um, allow me to share some slides, that would be terrific. And so that you can actually see some visuals of this program uh, that we call the Woodlots program that we 
uh, have that we'll be talking with you about tonight. Let me try to share that screen one more time. There we go. All right. So this evening, I'll be first going through some slides so that you can see some visuals and then I'll go through the toolkit itself. So today we'll cover, we'll start out with a background of who cold, cold hollowed a candidate is. Um, Nancy gave us, us a, a background and a description of that. So we can make that part pretty quick. Um, but then we'll go into the details. What is this Woodlots program? Um, I'll really start by outlining the program as cold hollow to Canada uh, leads it. Um, I wanna give you some background into our context and our goals so that you can really think through what is appropriate to keep the same in a new context and what will you need to adapt um, into the community that you would like to use it in. And then I'll go through this online toolkit and really show you how to use it, what's there, what you can find on that toolkit. So I'll start with a map of our region. So as Nancy mentioned, we're in Northern Vermont um, and our work really got started from a larger initiative um, called the Staying Connected Excuse Initiative. Me, Monica? I'm going yes. to break in. You're not in presentation mode and it's not advancing. Is that? Oh, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Is it just sharing my screen instead of my slideshow? It's uh, it just advanced to the map, but it's not. There we go. I think no, it's still in. Uh, it's not in slideshow. Thank you for sharing. Let's see. How's that? Now we got it. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so our work really comes out of, of this larger initiative, the Staying Connected Initiative, along with a group called Two, Two, uh, Two Countries, One Forest. These are both big regional partnerships across um, the northeastern part of the U.S. and southeastern Canada to identify connectivity areas, how forests connect across this region. Um, and you can see a few areas that are linkage areas that have been identified as particularly important to focus on if we want to maintain connectivity through this region. The one that is circled in orange is the one that we are working within. And Cold Hollow to Canada is actually only a, a tiny portion of that overall linkage area. Um, but we maintain this vision of a resilient and connected ecosystem across the whole area. But we only work, as Nancy mentioned, within the seven town region. And this is a very rural part of Northern Vermont. Um, this is our community context. As an organization, we see our role as to really be the liaisons between the partners involved in our regional conservation partnership um, that include the state agencies, some land trusts, um, many other partners and practitioners and then the individuals at this community level, the towns themselves, the conservation commissions and other conservation groups, the landowners in that region in particular, and the general public. Um, and we, we are really pulling in the resources from the upper part of the hourglass that you can see and bringing them to the people of this area. Again, thinking about our own context um, in, in the state where we work, more than two thirds of our forest is privately owned. Um, and so for us, we're very keenly aware that forest health relies on these individual decisions that are made by individual land stewards and managers in our region, largely at that parcel level. Um, and so our work is really about bringing together all of these individuals so that we can have a greater impact. As, mentioned, as Nancy mentioned, we really have three pillars of our work. We work with land conservation, and that, that's really forest conservation, um, forest stewardship, and community empowerment. And while the program that we're going to introduce to you tonight is really strongly associated um, with that, that forest stewardship piece, this is it, all of our work is really keenly interconnected. Um, we often use this mantra that you only see what you know, you only love what you see, and you only protect what you love. Um, and so all of our work is really about helping people to know more about um, the community around them, the forest around them, the actions that they are able to take so that they can start to see it and love it and protect it. 
So the Woodlots program is the program that we're really here to talk about. Um, and it's nested within those larger goals. The Woodlots program is based on this equation where we think we can take forest landowners, set them up into a peer engagement network, um, provide them with some things like technical assistance and funding when that's, when that's possible. And what we think we'll get out of this is enhanced stewardship and in some cases forest land conservation. Now on this, in this equation, I want to really emphasize that the piece that makes this program special is the peer engagement. Um, the technical assistance and funding, I don't wanna overwhelm anybody. These are things that we're kind of providing anyway or our partners as part of the regional conservation partnership um, are, are offering for the most part. Um, we're not encouraging anybody to start up new technical assistance programs or funding opportunities. That's kind of what we, what we pull into the peer engagement piece to make it attractive to our landowners. So this is about peer engagement. And what we do is we pull these groups to get together of neighboring landowners. Um, these are landowners in a rural community. Um, they, while they're from the same community, they haven't necessarily met each other uh, before the programs began. But we, um, we invite people who own land to, um, to quarterly gatherings. We have four per year. And at these gatherings, we go onto the land of one of the members and we go for a woods walk. Um, at these walks, there's always some kind of a learning experience. Sometimes we at, at Cold Hollow to Canada lead them. Um, Nancy has led a, a, a large number of these um, from her expertise, but we also invite in other experts. And part of the, the crucial part of this too is that, is that these woodland landowners are also learning from each other. Um, so, on these walks, I'll just go through a few photos of, of walks in the recent years. Um, this one is being led by Charlie Hancock, who is one of our board members and founding members of Cold Hollow to Canada. He's also a consulting forester. And in this case, he's leading this woods walk and he's, he's marking trees as he's going and really explaining the process to this group of landowners. Um, and this is on, he, it's on the, the land of one of the members and everybody else is their neighbor. So they all kind of get to know each other. They all get this experience together. They're learning. Sometimes we have um, really, sometimes our, our um, topics are very forest management based. Sometimes they're much more broadly based on focus, uh, topics of interest to the landowners in the, in the group. Um, here's one led by um, a mushroom expert, Meg Madden, and a bunch of the, the mushrooms, the fungi that she, um, she introduced to the group as we walked. Um, in this case, the, the person who you see in the green is the landowner of this parcel. Um, and, and this is what I mean where I, I don't remember anymore who was leading this walk, um, whether it was an expert or whether she was leading her own walk. But part of, of what's so neat and so special is that the landowners get to show off what they have done and their management and their ideas and their goals. Um, and within these neighboring groups, they get to know each other very closely um, and get to know the management that each, each person is doing. We go out, as I said, quarterly. So this means that we're out year round. Um, and since we live in Vermont, <laughs> we, we definitely have four seasons. Um, where we do these gatherings. So we'll go out on snowshoes in the winter and do you know, winter tree ID um, or other, other topics of interest. Um, here on the left, there was a recent culvert project that we're stopping to describe and, and look at and think about. You know, this was an NRCS funded um, opportunity so landowners can learn about the project. Um, think about whether they might want to implement something similar. And we can really look at how this project turned out, um, go through the details of the project. On the right, this one is a little bit more for fun. One of the landowners has a heron rookery on her land. And so we get to go out and see some wildlife as well. I'll also mention that during the pandemic, we started bringing these woods walks um, online. And while this program, we really see the benefits of this program as being the woods walks, the in-person connections between people out in the woods. Um, 
having a few options that were online actually brought in a wider variety of people. Um, we started having some absentee landowners, people who don't live right in our area and don't necessarily come out very often to our in-person woods walks, but they were able to access um, the webinars. Um, it, also, it also brought in you know, families with kids or other audiences um, who could listen to our topics. And, but, but sometimes have a hard time meeting it on our Saturday or Sunday afternoons when we usually meet. Similarly, if there are people who, um, in some of our groups, there, there are those who, who just can't physically go into the woods and walk around, and yet they're very interested in the subject matter, um, and they would love to have their neighbors over and connect with them over woodlot management. Um, and so sometimes we have presentations where we can just be more still. And then in this case, we still went out for a short woods walk after with those who wanted to attend, um, but we, we didn't do most of our learning in that session. Now, here's a key point to the way we do these woodlots gatherings is that after this educational section session in the woods, we almost always end with a potluck. Um, and a lot of our members, when we ask on surveys, why do you keep coming to Woodlots programs? They say the potlucks. Uh, it's a very popular um, portion of the program. And I would also say that this is where neighbors get to know each other. This is where that peer network becomes more than about just um, an educational program. This is where the, the landowners, these neighbors bond and start to chat with each other about the management that they're doing in the woods. That's when they share information about the consulting foresters they're using um, or how much they paid for a practice or if they got funding help from NRCS, how did that process go? Uh, this is the casual place where I think the program really thrives um, because after that more, more structured learning component, they just relax and they talk with each other uh, over food. Because of this too, these groups become community. Um, yes, many of these members were already neighbors, but neighbors don't necessarily run into each other in the grocery store and talk about the forest management that they're doing. And these people would tell you that this program has, has brought them together in a new way where they connect over the forest stewardship that they're doing um, and, and they become friends. Uh, these are these are very close knit groups at this point in time. Now, I also mentioned that in addition to um, the, the the woodlots walks that happen quarterly, there's this technical assistance component. Um, now, a lot of this technical assistance happens during these wood walks. Um, you can see Nancy, who is, as she mentioned earlier, the county forester and and as such a, a fantastic technical assistance provider with our Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Rec. Um, but in addition to the expertise that, that the presenters bring to these, we also have a couple of pieces that we give back to all of the participants who are enrolled in our programs. Um, one is that through a partnership with Vermont Audubon, um, Audubon comes out and meets with everybody enrolled in one of these peer learning groups. Um, they visit the property and they go through a songbird habitat assessment with the landowner. Uh, this is a written piece that they give back to the landowner that really identifies what's already on the property for songbird habitat and are there places where um, where that habitat they could they could manage the forest in some way to enhance the wildlife um, opportunities there. So in in our context um, and with our partnership, this is a partnership that we have. This is an, an option that we can just, our partners are already doing this, but we can give it back um, to the landowners and they love it and they connect over it. Um, we also go for a walk in the woods with somebody from Audubon afterwards as a group so that the group can kind of see these places in the forest, talk about it with the Audubon forester or biologist um, and, uh, and, and learn more together um, about how to integrate these ideas into future management plans. Similarly, um, with our partners at Vermont Forest Parks and Rec, we provide climate change analyses. Um, if you're familiar with the Northern um, in Institute, NIACS, uh, Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, they have a process uh, for going through a forest management plan and thinking about 
um, whether there is um, how, how the forest management plan is doing for adaptation and resiliency strategies. And so we go through this with every landowner. We give them a report back that shows, are there techniques you're already using um, in your forest management that help with climate um, adaptation or resilience? And then once again, at another woodlots gathering, we can go back out with landowners into the woods um, and, and go through some of these strategies, point them out in the forest so, so everybody can really see what we're looking at. Um, and ask questions at that time. So again, these are tools that we bring in. In your area or in your context, you might choose different strategies, different opportunities, but it is nice to have something um, that you can kind of give back to landowners. I'll also mention with the Audubon one in particular that Audubon offers this program to other landowners. It's not specific to this program, but as partners, they really like to have this group setting um, where they can, they can bring it to the group. They do these individual uh, reports for each landowner. But because the group will continue meeting in the future, they know that this isn't just a report that will sit on a shelf. It will keep coming back. It will stay alive because of the peer networking um, that happens with these groups. I also mentioned um, that we try to, to hook landowners in these groups up with funding and implementation options. Um, and like I said, many of these funding options opportunities already exist through um, like um, NRCS programs. Um, other times we bring the funding to people with um, grants that, that we write or that our partners get um, or through partnerships. Um, these three um, lovely youth are, um, are part of the, the VYCC, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps crew, uh, which is one of our partner organizations. They have a forestry crew that they can um, send out. They, they train them um, for, for, you know, so, so that these three have been trained on how to use, use chainsaws as part of their summer program. Um, but we can work with, with Audubon to do these forest habitat assessments. Um, identify some potential ways to make a forest more bird friendly, for example, and then work with our other partner, the VWE by CC crew, to come out and actually get that implemented, um, sometimes with external funding involved as well, but we, we use our partnerships well. In the Cold Hollow to Canada region, we actually have in that seven town, seven rural town area, um, we have five programs going right now. For the most part, these are single town programs where we decided that that was the right size program. We can go into a little bit more detail on what the right size might be in a different context. Um, in a couple of these programs, we've combined two towns together. Um, and again, we might wanna get back into that um, when we think about moving these programs to a different context. But each one has its own personality. Um, there are no two programs that are alike, <laughs> completely alike. They're all, they're all just different people. Um, and because it's, this is so much about the peer networking and about the people who come to it, it they each have their own flavor um, and, and that, it makes them really special. Our programs will not look the same as yours just because it will be different people involved. So if we do wanna get to the metrics of, well, how have we done um, towards our goals? Now, this is the kind of program that's it's hard to, to know how to measure it, um, but we do have participation in this very rural setting of over 100 landowners now um, in, in the program. Um, that's 100 individuals, 67 ownerships, covers 25,000 acres of, of forest land. Um, out of this program, there have been over 3,000 acres of land that we think were directly conserved as a result of the program. Um, we have lots of forest stewardship. If you, if you count that in terms of the practices accomplished, we have a long, long list um, of practices that have been funded through NRCS partnerships um, that, that really come out of this program as, as well. But I think the real benefit that I see to this program is this idea that you can take you know, a question or an idea that a landowner has like, okay, would really like to do this habitat management for, um, for a warbler, would like to improve bird habitat in our forest, for example. Um, and you can actually take the group through the process with one landowner and then bring everybody back to see the results. And so everybody in this group 
can, in a very friendly, open, <laughs> lovely setting, um, can really see each other's um, work uh, and their stewardship that they're doing. They can see them all the way through in order to consider whether they would like to do something similar. So um, in, I wanna say some thank yous just for the program. There were our people, these are funders who have funded our own program. Um, and then as Nancy mentioned earlier, we have a toolkit that we've created, again, thanks to some funders, um, it, where we've really brought this online so that you can, um, you can use this. This is an online toolkit. Uh, if you wanna copy down this, uh, this link now, you can, or if there's a way to send it to you later, I'm happy to send you the link later. But we'll go there and explore the toolkit itself online. And you can think about how to bring this into a different context into your own setting. All right, I think now you should be able to see my website. Can you see my website? I might have to stop it, stop sharing and resharing. Yeah, no, we can't see it. It's still the slideshow. Okay. okay, here we go. Sorry about that. I can't tell what I'm sharing from my own screen. I will. Okay. So the website itself. Here we go. Um, looks like this. <laughs> um, and, and this is all, the whole, this whole website that we are showing you is going to be really about, this is the toolkit itself. Um, it's divided into these top menus. We have one that's all about woodlots. Um, I'll go through this quickly, but this is a lot of the information I just gave you. So you can explore this on your own. We have a getting started where you really think about um, before you, you consider a program like this, what, what do you need to think about? Um, is this a good program for your area? And then we have some ideas for actually running a program. And in all of these, and we have a connect with us. Um, but in all of these, the idea is that we want, we, we've really tried to share all of the materials that we have. Um, and I'll, I'll point out some specific examples as we go through this, but everything from the emails that we send out to landowners who are invited into the program, that's up here. <laughs> um, so feel free to use that if it's helpful. Um, we are also aware that many of these are going to need to be adapted into this new setting as if, if, if you're going to um, be able to, to use it yourself. But I'll just quickly go through this. Um, this first category, like I said, is a lot of the information that was just in the slideshow. So I'm not gonna go into this in, in any detail, but I'll just show you in terms of, um, of using the website, you can use these top menus, or if you really wanna read it more like a book, then on each page, you can go down to the bottom and click this next button and it'll walk it through um, in, an, in an orderly fashion. So we have the goals of our program can consider whether yours are the same or different. Um, we talk about the peer engagement part of it. Again, this is all just the overview, so I'm not going to pause on the words. You can read it more in more detail on, your, on yourself by yourself later. Um, but these are the different parts of the program. And then if we go next into this getting started, um, here's where we can really start to think about whether these programs are for you. On this page, we've outlined our own goals. You can really think about whether those are the goals that you have. Um, but it also asks you to consider a few things that, that I think are essential wherever you are. Um, for us, the place really matters. This geography um, is what it's all about. For us, this program, the, the core message in this program is for landowners, what happens here in this place matters. Um, and so if you are considering a program like this, what is the message that you really want landowners to get at? Um, do you have a setting in which you can really engage people with this idea that your role, what you do in this place right here makes a difference for something bigger than just your own land? Um, for us, it's really this shared love of a place that brings people together. There are also, and you can again, read the, read the words here later, um, but in terms of the setting, there's also the logistics of a place that are really worth considering. Um, for example, if you, um, when we divide up our programs, it's really important we find um, to have a, a setting, a, a boundaries of one group 
where people are willing to drive a particular distance. And, and it might not be the same in all settings, but um, in our region, a town level works pretty well um, because the geographic boundaries mean that people are already kind of co co collaborating or connecting with one another. Um, if there's a big mountain range in the middle of that, of that logical political boundary, then you might, you might find that you wanna divide it into a couple different sections. Um, I, I guess the, in your context, you really wanna think about how, how far would people be willing to go for this? Um, in, in our region, I'm not sure people are willing to, to drive more than 10 minutes or so. Um, but if you're in a commuter community where everybody's always driving more than that, then maybe, maybe your boundaries could look a little different. Um, We've really listed some essential people too, where of course the landowners themselves are a really important piece of that. Um, we've given more information. I'm not going to go into these now and click these links, but program leadership or the partner organizations that um, could be helpful for a program like this or the practitioners um, in the woods. You can follow those on your own. Um, I'll point out that they're there, but for each of these, you can click on these and learn more. Um, for the landowners, we've given some detailed information on what we think is the right number, at least in our context. Um, we get too many landowners in a group, then there isn't that cohesive feel where they all, you know, enjoy potlucks together. Um, trust is a big part of this. So thinking about that, if you get too few, then you don't really have a core program. Um, it doesn't run so well. It doesn't become a cohesive unit. So we, we've given some guidance on how we think about that. We, we ask, we talk about who's invited. Um, one key to this program that we found is that this is actually an invitation only program. This isn't, uh, when we have a Woodlots walk, it's not just advertised broadly to the, to the whole community. We have really handpicked um, who in this community do we think will connect well in a group like this. We have some, um, some kind of minimum guidelines of how much land they need to, um, they need to own um, how they manage it um, in our in our community. Everybody is enrolled in a, a current use program, a use value appraisal, state tax um, reduction program because they own and manage actively manage. In um, they look towards the the forest health. Um, these are all people who we could talk with about conservation, um, and they won't. <laughs> they can have a conversation about that. Um, and so this is this is an invitation only type of program, um, not so much to be exclusive, but to make sure that these programs that, that we're running do work together as a cohesive unit um, and that everybody does share that shared, um, they, they connect because they are all landowners of larger um, properties or larger woodlands um, and they all share a few things in common to make the programs work. Um, let's see, talk about engagement and how it works. I'm not gonna go through all of the, the details here, um, but you can really look through this, this website later and think about these considerations if you're thinking about building your own program. Um, we can go through those other things like program leadership. Um, I'm going to go back up to here and, and move on to this next page, which is how to set up a program. One of the things that we've, we've laid out here is what we think of as the, the simplest version of a step-by-step -step guide, um, starting with getting to know your community. Um, this isn't something to run in a, in a new community to, as a way to get to know the community. This is really something, once you have a community of people, um, how to keep them engaged. So getting to know the community if you don't already, um, thinking about who are those potential landowners for that starter group um, that you can get going. You can always add more people later um, but if you have a core group of, of landowners who you think already live in a reasonable amount of, of distance from each other um, and could be a good core group, that's a good way to start. Um, sending out the invitation letters, and we've given an example of this letter. You, could, you can borrow widely from ours or completely scrap it and start new depending on what you'd like. We usually have an introductory just meet and greet. You know, there's never any, um, our landowners are never never signing up for the long term. Um, this is always voluntary, but it's nice to have this meet and greet where they, they really know for sure they're not 
they're not becoming members, they just get to come and ask questions and see if this is a good match for them. Um, I have a handout in there that's linked. We have the first real gathering and some ideas of what that might look like. Um, for example, we have them fill out a survey so that we have some that background information about their management goals and activities and interests. And that, that survey is linked here if you'd like to see it. Um, again, because of the partnerships and the context that we have, um, then within that first year of a program, we set up these songbird habitat assessments and climate change analyses. Um, partly because landowners love these. <laughs> um, it's a resource that they get back and it, it really engages them in the program um, once they see what they're going to get out of it like that. Um, these are all free for them. So, and then we start to plan the future gatherings. Um, again, I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We'll leave this open for questions, but I'll, I'll just kind of share a few things that we have in this running a program where we do go into more detail about the woodlot structure those wood walks and the sharing of food. Um, we get some details about the programming of what, what to do to get to know the group. Um, you can see the examples of our forest bird habitat assessments and climate change analyses. You can see what those look like. Um, we, we talk more about how we communicate with landowners between settings um, and even if you would like a to-do list, this is the to-do list that we have um, that you can download straight from here in a Word document that really gives a list of, you know, what do you need to do? What do we do at least um, to prepare for a gathering? Um, we have sample emails here. <laughs> Again, feel free to use what you want and, and abandon the rest. We have some ideas about program administration. Um, we have our history where it started out as just a volunteer run program. Um, it was purely volunteer before we started having more staff engagement over time. Um, and um, so you can kind of see our history there. We even included program expenses, which of course are going to change drastically in different parts of the country um, in, in different settings. But we can really, you can really think through what the expenses of a program are. I also want to really encourage you. I mean, we have built these programs over time. We have five of them. We, they're, pretty, they're pretty organized at this point in time, but they also don't have to be. This could be just your neighborhood group that you start as a volunteer. And it doesn't have to be this expensive, time-consuming thing. Um, but again, you can kind of see where this has come for us and think about whether that's how you want to run it or not. Um, and finally, some evaluation of thinking about how to measure your success of the program over the long run. Um, and uh, once again, I can leave that to you. But I think I want to stop there and really open the rest of this up for questions and discussion, ideas of how um, others might use this, um, how this could be adapted to other settings. And, and so I, I, would, I would really love for this to be more of a discussion from here on. Um, if anybody wants to either ask questions in the chat or um, this is a pretty small group, I think if you wanna just take yourself off of mute and, and ask the question, we'd love to hear from you um, if you have other questions. Yeah, maybe people could um, go back to video uh, too so we can kind of sit here together. Um, you know, you know I, I think that we, this is a really robust program now, but it didn't necessarily start that way. <laughs> so I, I think it's really important for people to take a look at this and know that you've got, this is the point of the toolkit is to have the tools. So we're preparing and providing you with the tools, but um, I can talk more if we need to uh, about how this began and, and uh, having a small uh, gathering of peer to peer uh, landowners is is sufficient. You know, it's uh, it's whatever it is that you need in your own world. So, if people have questions. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Um, I'm curious. Like, I understand you know the resources and the the program broadly, but at the very beginning, like, what are your first? How do you first plant that seed? You know, what were the very first steps in terms of starting to get? a half dozen landowners like what was what was the outreach how did you actually like brass tacks 
Were you just yeah. kind of calling up people on, you know, Belvedere Road and just saying, hey, you know, I see you three people live next to each other and have forests. Like, how did that seed start germinating? Yeah, so I can I can address that. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I'm a, being in the area, being county forester, and actually living in living in this region for most of my life. I have a lot of I, I know a lot of people to start with, so there was a connection. There's there's connections when we start, um, and but that's not true in every one of our woodlots groups. But as we first begin, kind of go um, go through the a, a list of of landowners in the in the neighborhoods and identify people with um, with with a, a certain size of property. You know, 20, 50 acres was our particular minimum. That could vary all over, anywhere wherever you are. But we sent we initially sent letters out. We sent a mass mailing to previously identified people. Um, with my background in the in the uh, in the county, I know people that wouldn't be interested. I know people that uh, so we don't always send a letter to someone. First of all, th this is when we talk, start talk about preaching to the choir. This is absolutely the choir, but the choir gets a lot of work done when they work together. So it is really about identifying people that we know are conservation minded, know that they want to um, work on these stewardship issues. So partly it's background of, of knowing, reaching out to the professionals in your area, if, uh, work with the service foresters in the area, the consulting foresters. My, the co-founder of this organization is Charlie Hancock. Um, he, we're both Forest Steward Guild members and uh, again, know lots of people. So sending that, uh, that kind of group letter out describing what we want to do and identifying a meetup time. And generally what happens, and it's happened consistently in all five of our groups, we would get half of the, uh, we'd send maybe 50 letters out in a town and half the people would respond. So that it's amazing how consistent that was. <laughs> so that's how we start. That's how we start. And partly it's people that already know us. And in one of the communities where I nor Charlie had as much influence, but that's where we did a lot of uh, community programming prior. So they got to know us. They got to know who Cold Hollow to Canada was. And I can add too that the members themselves, once you have even a few people who are identified and interested, then because these are, are smallish communities and we're talking about their neighbors, they know people too. And so sometimes the best outreach isn't through us, it's through those people who already know people. Um, and, it, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the whole group will already know each other when you get started, um, but, but we use those networks. <laughs> um, yeah, community leaders is really, is really yeah. critical. I don't know if that helped on, but uh, and it, if I go, it did. I I guess I I mean I'm not super surprised. Like with with your connections and everything, I mean you were you were really just looking at a map, saying yeah, I think these folks would be down with it. Like it was very um, just uh, organic. Um, it it wasn't an algorithm. It wasn't yep. like combing mailing lists like you really just kind of looked at a map and said yeah let's ask these 50 people and that was it that um, is correct yeah. <laughs> that, so that, that that's what is... i was that's what i was trying to figure out if there was any anything more than just you know knowing people and and just kind of cold calling um so that's it yeah if that's the answer then that's the answer <laughs> And, you know, if there's other ways to do it, that's that's the part that I really want to stress here, that just because we did it that way doesn't mean that's the way to do it in another yep. area, that other people may have different ideas about what that outreach looks like, mm -hmm. or partners, I mean, connecting with your with your other pa with partners and who they know, that's, that's yep. another possibility. Um, you know, yep. uh, we have a, a, a lot, a, a varied group of consulting foresters that are helping out with um, on these properties. So mm -hmm. again, reaching out to the uh, consulting foresters to ask them. Uh, so we know that you're working with this several people. Are some of these people that you think might be interested in coming to quarterly gatherings? Yep. There's 
the other thing is, you know, it's it's it is a certain segment of the society. Um, there's a lot of working force out there where, and landowners that are really bu too busy. Sugar makers don't tend to be part of our 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 Woodlots members. There's a few sugar makers, but they're not the industrial size scale. That, um, so, you know, it's folks that have the time. I can talk a little bit more um, on this idea of in invitation only because I think that's one of the I one of the things we get a little bit of pushback on, and honestly, it doesn't have to be this way with with your own groups. I know that the Forest Stewardship Center, Nor our Northwood Stewardship Center, uh, in Charles East Charleston, don't necessarily do it. They they have more of an open public engagement, so th they open these these uh, woodlot groups up to uh, a broader a broader public. So it doesn't have to be an invitation only. It's the way we did it uh, to, to basically to ensure uh, continuity um, because uh, the public engagement, they could, it's not something that builds over time typically, but you could build your constituency from that. So that was um, the idea. And initially we, we, we weren't even at the fully, the town, uh, the full town, uh, geography, even in the beginning, we actually uh, were talking about contiguous or nearly contiguous landowners. So that peer to peer, that land, that, that landscape stewardship was actually adjacent. Um, we discovered over time that that didn't matter as much. <laughs> people, people were still learning from each other. Uh, and so a watershed geography is perfectly fine uh, and not necessarily a town by town. Um, the other thing about invitation only, we also know um, detractors and we didn't want detractors at, at these events. And so that's that's another way that we were sort of sifting through uh, who, we're, who we were inviting. I can add to that too. As Nancy said earlier, she said, we are kind of preaching to the choir, but what I would actually say we're doing is we're assembling the choir. Um, we have people in our community who want to, you know, quote unquote, sing, um, in this case, through their forest management, and we're turning them into a group that has some cohesion and has some instruction and becomes a community. Um, and so to me, this is really, this, this is assembling a choir that doesn't exist without us. You know, it might be individuals who are wanting to sing, but it's not a cohesive group until we assemble them. Um, and, and to me that it's it's the creation of the choir that is the, the goal of this program. Um, we, I see we have a, a question in the chat about how long, it says, how long do you anticipate these groups to last? And that's a really good question um, in that, so the oldest group that, that Cold Hollow to Canada has, um, we started in, what was 2013. it, 2013. Um, so it's been around for about 10 years now, and it's definitely changed over time. Um, now, here's the thing with the groups is that in terms of the technical assistance, what we wanted this group to get out of it, um, this group has, has done a huge amount. A lot of the land in that oldest group is conserved now. They've done a lot of land management. Um, they kind of know what they're doing at this point. In terms of our goals, it could be that there isn't a benefit to continuing having that program. Um, however, the group really loves meeting. <laughs> they want it to continue. Um, the, the, the group has, has changed. It's morphed over time. We have done more of a deep dive more recently into, into some what I'm going to call advanced topics like land conservation um, or we're doing some legacy planning now um, with these groups which might not be the first things to introduce to a real a brand new group when they're just getting to know each other. So there's, there's kind of this maturing process that happens over time. Um, if, if you're worried about the time investment, then, you know, I think with this, this group in, in this, in Enosburg, the old, the town that we started out in, we could, we would consider it a success if that group were not continuing to meet at this point in time. Um, I'm not sure we have to continue it into the future. But the group just loves meeting and they are still individually getting things out of it. 
Yeah, and, and we also, we we do meet four times a year uh, with each group. And of course, not everybody can always come, obviously. Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case either. Two times a year is also a sufficient number of times for a group to get together, particularly if it's a small group. One thing that we find uh, uh, people are hosting. So if you have too small of a group, they're hosting too often. And so that's kind of a burden. Um, you know, and this is really a trust uh, development kind of program and a, and a learning program where people, uh, that when they see something done on someone else's property that they might've been hesitant to do themselves, but they can see it and walk around in it. It, it really takes the, the, that fear factor of harvesting, harvesting and cutting trees away. And with a fully understanding, full understanding of the of the result, you know, after ten years of seeing people's property, we we can really see what management does on the landscape, and that has been just game change, changing, really. And the, the, when we were doing our climate change analyses, that was ten years ago, also, and there, that was a time when uh, there was professionals were were telling us not to use the words climate change. Well, we we chose not to go that direction, and we we laid it out. Uh, directly. And it, it was probably one of the most empowering things I've seen is for people to understand what they were doing on their landscape to um, adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change stress on their forest, that they were actually doing something just was really empowering to them. And, and so that, that, that's that trust issue. Um, I'll say one more thing and, before, and, and see if oh, there's a, some questions that are coming in. Um, I want to talk quickly about leadership. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is this landscape, peer-to-peer, -peer, landscape level management and a lot of programming. And it's a, it's a strong desire to do this, but we have found that there really does need to be an individual or a group of individuals that coordinate and bring people together. Um, we've, we've tried to mature into a landowner driven group and it hasn't happened. Um, it's uncomfortable for landowners to reach out to their neighbors uh, on these issues when they might not know the topic, even though we've, we've said that we would support them, we would be there, we'd offer the speakers. It's still something that uh, landowners prefer that the organization, the behind the scenes stuff gets done by Cold Hollow to Canada volunteers and staff. And believe me, it was volunteer in the beginning too. So one group, you can easily do one group uh, just at a volunteer level. Um, in, in answer to that question about funding the work consistently. So as, as Nancy mentioned, this started out as just a volunteer program that really didn't have funding of its own. And, and actually the, the way it's currently run, Nancy runs much, much of this program on her own as a volunteer at this volunteer. point in time. <laughs> What was that? Uh, volunteer, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and Nan Nancy, of course, is a volunteer extraordinaire. Um, but this program, over time, um, Cold Hollow to Canada has found funding opportunities as well. We actually have one very wonderful, generous um, grantor um, through the Vermont Community Foundation that that supports a lot of this work over time. Uh, we feel our, our, that, we're, that we've been very lucky for that. But if you're just getting started, I want to encourage you to not let that budget piece um, get in the way, it, because you can really be creative about either doing this in a voluntary way, keeping it small, um, really, it, you, or, or doing it as part of an operating budget um, or getting a small grant for one person to help coordinate it over time. Um, and then once you've assessed it, you can you can decide whether you want to expand the way Cold Hollow to Canada did, in which case you might need more funding or not. The other thing that we use our budget for now is we do like to pay speakers. Um, but I also, again, want to say that if you have partner organizations who already have skills to offer, um, we, we rely heavily on our state partners um, where we have folks at our state fish and wildlife department or our forest parks and rec who are really trying to do outreach anyway and want to reach people we're providing them a way to reach landowners in bulk <laughs> um, and so so many of those partners are happy to provide their services when we start a program the first couple years of the program really don't need a lot of those outside paid speakers 
um, it is the more maturing programs where over time um, we, we want to bring in some some extra people. And so so speaker fees kind of go up over time as we expand our outreach and our opportunities. Yeah. And for clarity, um, I, I volunteered the organizational background, but but actually as a as a service forester, I'm there for outreach. So my department uh, supports me in the in the program programming itself. Um, so there's a I, I walk a, a, a fine line here. Some of some of the work I'm doing is volunteer on my own time, but some of it is also part of my my work time. So that's where you reach out to your partners and you can build that. Um, we could easily have done two or three of these Woodlock groups uh, in that way. Once we get up to five, that we really need staffing to to uh, to help out. But you know that's that's a growing program, and with a growing program, funding becomes available. Any other questions out there? I do want to, um, again, state that people have been using our toolkit. There's several people that have been using it in their own way. And, uh, and, and so it's the whole idea of the toolkit was not to create a, um, a model that needs to be followed exactly. This really is just, we, get, we just put everything we've done into this toolkit so that people could have uh, have those resources, but you can adapt it and change it however, however you choose. I will also add that if folks out there are interested in learning more about how they can run something like this or adapt it to a different setting, um, I would actually love to talk with you. Um, there's actually an opportunity that could be coming along. This is just a thought in my head right now, but um, I actually teach at Middlebury College um, in, 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 currently in addition to what I'm doing at, at Cold Hollow to Canada, but I'd really like to think about ways to bring students into this work and maybe even use students um, to help start programs in other areas if there's interest. Um, again, this is something that's right now just an idea in my head, but if you would like to do something like that, I would really love to chat with you um, and, and see what could be useful for other groups uh, as I think about a way to do this. I actually came here, I'm a forester in Maine, in Orland, next to Bucksport. And um, I don't have really enough landowner to do that with, with forests. But at the moment, I work to do a street inventory in Bucksport. And I do that together with a lady who is very interested in telling the other people in town about the benefits of trees, especially, but also other green stuff. So in addition to that, um, I really like what I saw from uh, Doug Tallamy, who is nature's uh, uh, homegrown nature park or national, whatever it's called. And I think in a way what, what I did hope to get some inspiration here and I did, um, is how to structure that uh, to get the people in town uh, to understand how important all the nature stuff it is in the town uh, for all kinds of things. And the, the big problem is now to organize and at the moment, I have the feeling you really were in a in an extraordinary situation with Nancy knowing a lot of landowners, having a constant contact, being being appreciated and recognized there. Um, I tried 
in uh, in our area in Hancock County here. Um, I I thought uh, we we have a problem with the brown tail moss, mm. and I thought that would be a fantastic thing to get people to kind of try to organize to get a handle on that. It was such a failure. Even <laughs> so, I had, I had the uh, Zone and Water District involved, the Forest Service, uh, all kind of uh, Hancock County Planning Commission, whatever. And we had uh, a presentation then of Calamity's talk, uh, one hour talk in the Bucksport Library, and we had one person come and five person on Zoom. So Jake, one of the things that I would suggest about, um, this really would, it, it lends itself really well to urban and community forestry, actually. It's not the way that we've been doing it, but you by one of the ways you can think about it is breaking things into neighborhoods, right? So right. instead of, instead of a, um, forest town, a gathering of forest land owners in a town, you can identify a neighborhood. And one of the things I think is the both instead of coming with your idea already with the with with the, the moth, for example, um, that you you might start more organic without a particular topic in mind. And when wait to hear what the landowners there themselves want to talk about. And uh and you know just getting people together. I have to say, getting people together in a nearby park or a place where there you can share a picnic. I have we can't we can't uh, say enough about a about a potluck. <laughs> I mean, it really is the way to get people to sit down and talk with each other, and then and and then maybe brainstorm. I know some of the things that they care about within their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, is it pollinators? Is it you know you have a list of a bunch of things. Um, to to spearhead, but but uh, you know, lay it back down on the land on the people because the, this is it, the idea is peer to peer. So really finding out what they want to have rather than coming to them with with a plan, a predetermined plan. But wouldn't you have to have a topic and something to attract the people? Well, actually, I really think you could have a list of uh, offer a list in a letter that you send out or or flyers that you put on someone's door. That's another way to do it. And just say, you know, make have a variety of things and just get together and talk, you know, get together, share who you are. What are your goals? What are you that's gonna, That's in the toolkit, actually, is, is how we start out. We just start out with a you know, kind of a meet and greet and without any really defined um, because that's really a that's a. That's a public outreach. That's a and which is totally wonderful. That's a, that's a but it's not peer to peer learning. And this peer to peer learning really would be more focused on a street or a neighborhood or perhaps a, a community garden. You know, you know, finding people that already are going to be able to connect and and kind of stay connected. That's that's what makes this distinct. Monica, did you? I was also just going to add that I think when we're used to public outreach, then our numbers that we expect to come to a public event tend to be really high, where if you have, um, in a public outreach event, if you have only a handful of people, that might not sound like a success. But when you're doing peer-to-peer -peer learning, sometimes it is those small groups. I mean, you mentioned yeah. the one person came in person, but then you had a few on Zoom. Um, was it four? And honestly, starting with a group of five, might be a great place to start if you can start to form connections among those five. Um, and then you can use those people to reach out and see if they know anybody else who might also uh, want to join that group. But five, five doesn't necessarily sound like a bad place to start to me. Thanks, Janet. Uh, appreciate your your sentiments there. Um, we we really do love this program, uh, uh, and it has really shown to be really successful. And it can the beauty of it it can take on so many different roles in different ways. As Monica said, each of our landowner groups are really different, and we and we listen to how those differences um, 
express. But thanks. Thanks for listening to us. <laughs> Any other questions out there? We are accessible. If anybody has questions they want to follow up with us later on, that's great. Um, I think um, Colleen can get our email addresses out, but I'll put mine in the in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. I'm writing mine in there too. Yeah, and really do feel free to reach out if you have questions, if you want to have a more personal conversation about, you know, ideas of, of bringing this to a different context, a different location, different community. I mean, we could even entertain, we're, we're in a very rural neck of Vermont, but I think we all have some ideas, Nancy and I both have some ideas about how this could be adapted into some very different settings. Um, but, you know, it would need to be an individual process for, for each of those. Um, That's where the cool. toolkit comes in um, for open source use. You can take it and, and get ideas um, from the toolkit. And uh, I want to thank the Forest Stewards Guild for allowing us to bring this to you all. Um, I've been a member of the Forest Stewards Guild for a really long time. As I say, my the, uh, my co-founder and colleague and friend, Charlie Hancock, is also a member of the Forest Stewards Guild. Um, this is a guildy thing to do. <laughs> so um, reaching out to uh, foresters in your community is another way to, to move forward on this kind of a program. <laughs>